and welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Omicron has forced us back into this funny little nook in my library, but allowed us to reach across the country for some very exciting guests. Today we're going to talk about dyslexia and Hank Zipser, both the novels and the very fun, very successful BBC series, which you can catch worldwide on YouTube. I'm delighted to welcome physician, neuroscientist, and author of Overcoming Dyslexia, the go-to book on the subject, Sally Shaywitz from Yale University's Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, and the author, Henry Winkler. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Here. One of the things that struck me in both the books and the television series was how extraordinarily kind the character Hank Zipser is. And you'd think that this is a good question to throw at Hank's creator, but I'd love to get the neuroscientist's perspective. Dr. Shaywitz, was Mr. Winkler on to something when he created such a warm, empathetic, dyslexic character? Absolutely. Mr. Winkler was spot on. Dyslexics tend to be warm and empathetic. And let me give you two examples. We do brain imaging where our participants go to the MRI lab and are imaged. One day, the technician who interacts with our participants spoke to me sharing, you know, Dr. Shaywitz, your participants are different than unusual. They're very caring and warm and always asking about how I'm doing and what can they do to help. Dr. Bennett Shaywitz and I have developed a sea of strengths conceptual model of dyslexia based on our data and experiences. And this indicates that dyslexia has a circumscribed weakness connected to sounds, which is very noticeable early on in school. What is less noticeable, but probably even more important, is that this weakness surrounded by a sea of strengths in higher level critical thinking and reasoning and empathy. Watching the TV series, I cheered for Hank when he and his sister figured out a way to get out of super strict Miss Adolph's class and into the soft, fuzzy arms of a sweeter teacher who wanted him to share his difficulties with the class. But the embarrassment of saying out loud, I have dyslexia, was worse than Miss Adolph and her fencing foil. I did not sign up for this. Henry, why, for a kid like Hank, would dyslexia feel different from other disabilities? Well, I, I only know mine. I only know how dyslexia affected me. You know, um, Miss Adolph was my real teacher. I raised my hand in the fourth grade to go to the boys' room. I'm still waiting for her to call on me. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that I looked around and I saw everybody and I thought, they're, they know it. They're, why don't I know it? They, they're making fun of me. When we, when we got a little higher in grade and we were all applying to college, they were talking about every college they could and wanted to get into. I, I applied to 28 colleges. I got into two. One of them I never heard of before. So it's constant... Um, a difference. I'm always on the outside looking in, and it felt terrible. In your book, you talk about George and Matthew and Charlotte, successful adults, successful adults, but still struggling and still afraid of being found out. Why? Well, I think it's not so much as being found out as that dyslexia is so misunderstood. People confuse slow reading with slow thinking and are unaware of the scientific and now definition of dyslexia in federal law. The 21st century definition of dyslexia, Public Law 115-391, passed in December 2018 by both houses and signed by the president, is so important because what it says is that dyslexia is an unexpected difficulty in reading, unexpected difficulty in reading for an individual who has the intelligence to be a much better reader. So the 21st century of definition of dyslexia as unexpected is very important. It establishes that as a dyslexic, you can be very bright and yet read slowly. You don't have to score below a certain level of reading. 
It's how you go about reading, the manner in which you read, and especially how long it takes you to read. And at the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, Sally and her husband Bennett have been watching the brain read. Sally, what is it we do when we read? We as humans evolved to speak. We've been speaking forever. But we didn't evolve to read. Speaking is natural, but reading is acquired. The lines and circles of print take on meaning when they're linked to something that has inherent meaning, spoken language. So print links to the sounds, the phonology of language. And I love this quote from Leonard Bloomfield, where he said, writing is a way of recording language by visible marks. And it really goes to what we call the alphabetic principle, which says that words are not whole envelopes of sound, but are comprised of segments. And these segments represent sounds. So for example, the word cat is made up of three sounds or phonemes, k, a, and t. And what happens when we read, we link the letters to the sound. So the printed word has the same number and sequence of sounds is the spoken word. So all readers must take the same steps, but the difference is in the effort and time it takes. And now that we've been able to image the brain working during reading, we've discovered, and uh, you'll see it, there are the two slides that show the, the neural systems for reading. There were, all, there were three of them, three major ones, and they're all located in the left hemisphere. Two are in the back of the brain, posterior systems. They're called parietal temporal and a very, very important one called occipital temporal. And there's also one in the front of the brain, anterior, that's called the inferior frontal. And we've also discovered, Bennett has, a neural signature for dyslexia. And this is really, really important. What it shows that those systems in the back of the brain that are very important for fluent or automatic reading, they're inefficient in dyslexia. That means that those systems are not working efficiently. It doesn't mean there's a big hole there. It just means they're really not working automatically. The dyslexic reader has to rely on a secondary system, an ancillary system that will get him or her to, the, to read, but it won't be automatic. Allie, can I ask you a question? Why don't they work? They're there. You showed me on the, on the um, uh, diagram where they're all located. Why doesn't mine work? You know, if you can discover the answer to that, you'll join Bob Dylan in getting a Nobel Prize. Uh, we, we, we don't know. You know, that's where further research is necessary. But the fact is that they are there. They're just inefficient. So uh, the, the dyslexic reader has to rely on secondary systems. I can't just wake it up, huh? You can, but it doesn't mean it'll be correct. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much taught by media that dyslexia is a visual discrepancy. Things swim around on the page, but I keep hearing that it's an auditory issue. I so learn that's... through my ear. I, I absolutely can. It's, I have a lot of trouble learning with my eyes. I listen, and that's how I know most of what I know. I could not read it. Uh, in high school, I carried the book and I dropped water on the pages so they would crinkle up so it looked like I was just beating my book into submission. <laughs> but I never read uh, A Tale of Two Cities or Ivanhoe or anything. Dyslexia is a disorder involving the language system. One of the major misconceptions of dyslexia is that it is a visual deficiency which is totally wrong. And in terms of auditory, yes, it comes in through your ear, but it goes to the language system. 
So what you hear and what's helping you so much is language. So I think it's important that people appreciate it. I can understand why people say, oh, it's visual, you know, you read, you see, but it's not what dyslexia is. In the BBC series, Henry Winkler himself steps into the shoes of the world's best teacher, Mr. Rock, who is a music teacher. In real life, was your experience learning music affected by dyslexia? Not so much music, but Mr. Rock himself. I played a real guy. Uh, and that teacher said one sentence to me. He said, Winkler, if you ever do get out of here, if you ever do graduate high school, you're going to be great. Mm -hmm. They thought I was going to matriculate for like 26 years. <laughs> I took geometry for four years, same course. I took it in regular school, summer school, regular school, summer school, all the way to my senior year of summer school. I finally passed with a D minus. I couldn't figure it out. It never, still doesn't make sense to me. From the day I got a D minus in August of 1963 until this morning when we're all together, not one person has ever said hypotenuse to me. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. All that humiliation, all that failing, all that doing and undoing and redoing for what? I think we have to teach children how they learn, not what we think they should learn. I second that. Sally, does, does every dyslexic learner have to hack away at their own unique path or, or, or are there markers along the way to help? Oh, good question. Yes, good question. And the answer is yes and no. About two decades ago, the National Reading Panel on which I served documented the overwhelming scientific evidence about the steps involved in reading. And that's an overcoming dyslexia on pages 253 to 255. So to read, children must be taught alphabetics. And that includes chemical awareness skills, that being able to appreciate the individual sounds that comprise words and phonic skills, which associates the sounds with letters. They need to be able to read fluently, that is accurately, rapidly, and this is the most important, with good understanding. They have to develop a good vocabulary and the ability to comprehend what they read. So gradually and sequentially, from the time children are toddlers through their first year of formal education, they are busily acquiring these raw materials, becoming a reader. Failure or delay in acquiring these skills is among the earliest clues to a potential reading problem. Can I just say, Please. talking about exactly what Sally is talking about, I cannot to this day at 76 sound out words. So I have above my computer the word schedule uh, typed out because I use it so often in an email and I, I, I can't figure out that word patience, tenacity, gratitude. They're all up here because I'm typing away. And sometimes I use spell check and my computer says, are you joking? What the hell is that? I have no idea what you just typed in. But I think this is so important. Obviously, look how intelligent Henry is and accomplished. And yet he has these difficulties. So having dyslexia and not being able to recognize words has nothing to do with your level of intelligence. You know what I say to every student that I have ever met, every kid anywhere in the world, how you learn has nothing to do with how brilliant you are. How you learn, how difficult it is, has nothing to do with your destiny as long as you keep your will and your tenacity uh, just always looking forward. Well, we're aligned. We see that in I Got a D in Salami. At the very end, the character finds out what it is. And Henry, so what is that experience of finding out? Oh, that, uh, I'll tell you that I did not know 
I was called stupid. I was called dumme Hund by my German parents, which means dumb dog. I was called lazy. And uh, when I got married to Stacy, she had a son. And so Jed came into my life. He was four. And we finally, in the third grade, had him tested. And everything they said about Jed was true about me. And I finally realized at 31, I've got something with a name. It's not just that I'm stupid. My brain is wired differently. <laughs> but you know, I'd like to go back for a minute and just ask Sally um, that sometimes schools don't want to spend the money. It's not only that they won't admit or use the word dyslexia, it's more expensive, so they don't want to spend the money on the kid. Well, it, 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 it's true, but let me let me explain a little bit. Yeah. One, you know, you, we say expensive. In the long run, it's less expensive. Yeah, right. To the school, to the child, and to the community. To the yeah. But the schools, they're so afraid of it. They 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 don't understand it. And and what what just gets me is the advances in our understanding of brain mechanisms underlying reading are nothing short of revolutionary. Much of the time, it feels like this new information is a well-kept secret. In dyslexia, we have the scientific knowledge. In dyslexia, the major problem is not, not a knowledge gap, but an action gap. To move forward, we must align education with 21st century science. And the good news is that we can, but we have sufficient knowledge to screen for, to identify and provide effective evidence-based interventions. I was um, invited, uh, I lobbied to be invited, <laughs> to speak to, um, uh, the Department of Education of a major city. And I was so excited. I said, oh my God, I, I prepared what I thought was, a, and Bennett thought was a good talk about dyslexia and, uh, and gave it. And at the end, a, the person who in that area, in that region was in charge of special education said to me, oh, so the, the teacher will find out that the student is at risk for dyslexia. I said, yes. And then she said to me, oh, and then she'll tell the parent. I said, yes. And she said, then she'll want services. I said, yes. And you know what she said to me? Then we're not interested. I can't even tell you the chills that went down my body. It's one thing for someone like me to be telling others this, but to experience this personally, I just couldn't believe it. Teachers in America, it, it, it is amazing to me how disrespectful we are of the teacher. Uh, they don't get paid enough. Uh, they are overloaded with, they have to teach the same amount of material to the fastest student and to the slowest student and they have to cover it all in the year. And uh, somebody is going to fall through the cracks. Uh, it, it's just amazing to me how we don't support teachers with enough material and enough time. And on top of all of that, some of those teachers close their day and then go to their waitressing job because they're not making enough money to live. Right, there you go. Personalities. So. Yeah. On the back of Dr. Shaywitz's book, Overcoming Dyslexia, Nobel laureate Bob Dylan weighs in with a long, lovely paragraph of praise for Sally and her book. And the last sentence reads, her constant fight to change public policy as it relates to the way dyslexia functions and is understood in the nation's school should be deeply meaningful to anyone who cares about children in today's world. And while we can all agree that the personal experience of overcoming dyslexia is awesome and huge, I'd like to point out that Dylan did not write anyone who cares about their own child's development. So Sally, are the individual disruptions of dyslexia a public issue? You bet it is. <laughs> dyslexia is universal. It occurs in every language, 
uh, all over the world. I've been to so many countries that have, um, you know, printed my book and have an incredible interest in dyslexia because it affects so many children. It affects all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. And as I just said, it's really, really common. If it affects both boys and girls, and it's persistent, it's lifelong. It can get a little better with help, but you'll always be dyslexic. And it's the most common learning disability. It affects 80 to 90% of all individuals identified as LD. Yes, 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 yes. The disruptions brought about by dyslexia is very much a public issue, but it must be recognized as such in order for both the individual and society to benefit. Can I just say something I, uh, on the back of what Sally is saying? I have met so many individuals who can't read, adults who can't read, and they, they have been offered jobs that are a step up in their company. They've been offered more money than they are making right now. And they are either intimidated that they can't read so that they would not be good in the new position. If we took care of the child and help them figure out how, what, what uh, techniques uh, they could use to, uh, to move forward in reading, writing, math, that individual, that adult, could take the next job. What's the correlation between dyslexia and poverty? I'm so glad you asked that question. Far too often, the reading struggles are ascribed to the child's being poor. What? Little done to diagnose the actual difficulty, the failure to screen for and the cost of dyslexia can be very high. The child who's not identified does not receive evidence-based instruction, continues to struggle, and sees themselves as a failure and not smart. And, and the critical thing is they have no knowledge of what their difficulty is, that it has a name, dyslexia, and there's no awareness of why they can't do what their peers can do. They don't know that you can be smart and dyslexic. They're often bullied and teased to the point where they don't want to read aloud in class. And they rather do something naughty and send to the principal's office rather than have to read aloud in class. And they eventually see themselves as not meant for school and drop out. And there is an unbelievably high prevalence of prison, of dyslexics in prison. We actually, with uh, Dr. Laura Cassidy, have just published a paper on dyslexics in prison. Just about half of the prisoners bright people with potential are dyslexic. So it, it becomes important for these individuals, remember, it's one out of five to find out that what they have has a name. And it means you can have struggles in reading, but be very smart. So that it, we are letting so many people down by not identifying and not using evidence-based screening and instruction so that pe people know what they have. It's hard. Unbelievable, I, I saw on uh, the news some rocket we sent up has gone millions of miles successfully. We can do that and we can identify, screen for and identify a person who's dyslexic. You tell me, where are we gonna get better payoff? Can I also, cause it blew, I, it kind of, it's shocking that are you saying that in communities uh, where a child is poor, if he is also exhibiting signs of dyslexia, 
the dyslexia is not treated because the child is poor and poverty is pointed to as the reason the boy can't read or the girl can't read? I wish I could say you're wrong, but that happens all the time. And in fact, in federal law, it says that if you're if you can't be diagnosed as dyslexic if you live in poverty can you believe that this is 2022 and we go to the moon but we can't diagnose a poor child as dyslexic you know they they say that tests in the third grade give um uh give the government a sense of how many prison cells they have to build. So I'm always wondering why children and government don't go hand in hand, how the, the government talks about children, but don't actually really care. And I asked questions for years and finally got the answer. And, you know, they, they say what is true um, uh, and, and are not always aware of what they're saying. Children don't contribute to political campaigns. So we don't really spend a lot of time dealing with them. There's so much to talk about and just not enough time. You can find the rest of this discussion as web extras. And of course, check out Sally's book.